sitting at a red light endlessly with your foot on the clutch for minutes on end. Dude, bad idea. And I bet you don't know the full extent of the problems this might cause. I'm John Cadogan from autoexpert.com.au and I get new cars cheap for buyers here in Australia or let us friggin' rejoice. Website for that, obviously. Or you can just click the card that's up there now, dude. This report is inspired by you. Someone just like you. Eerily like you, like uncannily so. In fact, only your respective dominatrice eye can tell you apart. This, of course, is derived from the Latin dominatrus amundo, meaning somewhat stern woman with deeply calloused palms, which is fairly interesting when you think about it, even though I just made it up. In one of your reports, you advise stick shift drivers, real drivers that is, to put the gearbox in neutral and release the clutch at red lights. This saves the clutch springs. I've always done that, but I've been wondering lately, what really kills a spring? Emmy award-winning question there, dude, but that's not actually what I said. In fact, I think the clutch springs themselves are going to be fine until approximately the heat death of the universe. They're quite durable things, like most of the springs that you and I might interact with on a daily basis. There is, however, a very good reason not to declutch endlessly when you are stopped in a manual, which we will get to in just a sec, but it's not about clutch spring longevity at all. But let's run with this spring thing for the time being, however, just for kicks. If I take a piece of tin and bend it once, it'll stay like that and preserve a modicum of integrity. But if I bend it back and forth, it doesn't take long for it to snap. It's actually the dynamics of changing its shape which degrades its integrity. See where I'm going here? Please help me understand. When an average person thinks of steel, they generally think of beams and columns, big steel plates, tools made of steel, things of that nature, okay? They often don't think of the material itself, but I'd suggest that kind of thought process is entirely unhelpful when it comes to ghetto engineering, like applied physics in the beer garden or something. You've got to think of steel like a cake, okay? And when you think of the term cake, there's a thousand different kinds, right? You've got your chocolate cake and your sponge cake and your cheesecake and your friggin' carrot cake and all these different kinds of cake. Yeah, wedding cake, birthday cake, all that stuff. My favourite kind of cake, incidentally, is the really big one that's reserved for life's really special occasions. You know the one I mean, you've had one, the, the, the huge cake. Everyone sits around, there's a stripper inside and nobody knew. How did she get in there? How did she survive the frigging baking process? That's what I want to know. I, uh, women have a much higher pain tolerance than men. I put it down to that. But I'm glad she does survive because otherwise, like, dude, what a letdown. So steel's kind of like that, only not quite as titillating. But there's plenty of different kinds. And certainly the cake full of stripper equivalent is spring steel, which we'll get to. But much better just thinking of steel in terms of its behavior broadly, okay, when you load it up. And here's a graph. It's got stress and strain written on it and people are already going, oh Jesus, stress and strain, what is that? Here in the ghetto, all right, it's really just load and displacement, movement, elongation, whatever, okay? It's like load, movement, load, response, load, response, load, response. It's however the thing moves, okay, in response to load. So load, movement, all right? And I used to work in a testing laboratory and we used to break steel samples all the time and it was kind of a big deal because it was a NATA registered laboratory and the steel samples we were testing were often related to things impacting human safety. You had to make sure that the steel was the right recipe so that you know things didn't collapse. So there was a pretty serious dimension to testing these samples. It was also quite fun because the rig that we used to test them on, the big one anyway, was 100 tonnes, and when you break something with 100 tonnes of load on it, it kind of goes off with rather a large bang. So the interesting thing about that is, 
the graph that you get directly out of a testing machine is exactly this. Obviously, you know, the load varies in terms of its number and the amount of elongation varies because some steel is more malleable than others, right? But the shape is exactly this every time, okay? So there's this straight bit here and a little tiny dip and then a curvy bit and then it breaks, all right? So there's a few landmarks on the way. And obviously this is one landmark called the yield point. As high as it gets is the ultimate tensile strength. And then after that, if you don't back off the load, failure is a certainty, okay? Because it needs less load to achieve even more elongation. But the really interesting thing that's relevant to spring performance is the yield point here, okay? It's a straight line up to the yield point. And what happens is, just like the ruler, you bend it and it goes back to its original shape. And you bend it and it goes back to its original shape. And as long as you don't get that high on the curve, it will do that forever. If you go past this point, you get to permanent deformation. And I do love you in the most platonic way, but not enough to ruin my ruler. So let's try it with a bit of this. This is just a bit of really low quality galvanized steel strapping, whatever. When you bend this, you can bend it a little bit, okay? And it just returns to its original shape every time. And you could do that, <laughs> you could do that until I cured your insomnia and it would still be doing that, okay? It's behaving just like a spring up to that point. We're operating in this region here. But obviously if you go past the yield point, which is easy on thin steel like this, you just get that. So we're somewhere on the graph like this. And interestingly, when you get on the graph like this, you can still bend it a little bit like that, and it still returns to its original friggin' shape, which is kind of clever. That's what allows you to bend a coil of steel bar into shape and end up with a coil spring that behaves like a spring. So you bend the bar permanently into its coily shape, and then you operate it like that. It's a spring, okay? You can't do that forever though, that permanent plastic type deformation in this region, because if you do, steel's composed of all of these grains, right? And they sit together and they're locked reasonably close together like that. And when you move them in this plastic region here, the grains go like, like that. And when you bend them again, they go like that. And they're intolerant of that. And they undergo this process, which is called work hardening and they get less and less tolerant of being manipulated in this way. And eventually, with not very many bends, that happens, okay? And that's kind of bad if that's the spring that holds up the front left corner of your car, which is why springs are very carefully designed to operate in this region of the curve only. And let's face it, springs are friggin' ubiquitous, right? You've got a hundred around you. There's one in your drop saw that brings the blade back up out of the work, right? There's one in your tire pressure gauge, which will endure on and off with the air endlessly for years and years and years and behave exactly the same throughout all of that time. The rubber hose is gonna fail before the spring in the valve. Okay, you got your crimping pliers, same thing. You can see the spring there, right? It's gonna do that for an electrician for 20 years and function exactly the same 20 years down the track as it does on its first day out of the box. Because every spring that you encounter is operating like that, somewhere in this curve, conservatively shy of the yield point up here. That's the magic of springs, okay? And there's a special formula. They're substantially stronger than a big steel beam. I'm standing right under it now, right? A big steel beam is made of mild, mild, mild steel. <laughs> and mild steel has a minimum yield point of 250 MPa, okay? Don't worry about the MPa, the megapascal thing. It's just a comparative number. If you really care about it, it's newtons per square millimetre. That's the easiest way to think of it. And newtons, like, oh, Jesus. A newton is about 100 grams of force, okay? Like, literally, 100 grams of sugar concentrated into one square millimetre of area is one megapascal. And if you take one kilo, which is about 10 of them, and you put it on the ultimate stiletto heel, you've got 
10 megapascals, all right? And mild steel holding the beam up, it's like 25 times stronger than that kind of load before it yields, minimum, okay? Spring steel is between 400 and 1200, right? So it's about two to six times, quote unquote, stronger than mild steel, even though I hate that term, it doesn't really mean anything. And they get it to this kind of uh, strength, if you like, by giving it a precise formulation. There's all different recipes for spring steel. It tends to have manganese in it a little bit. It's a low to medium carbon steel. It might have chrome vanadium alloys. It might have chrome silicon. It might even have chrome and nickel in it. And if it does that, it's also stainless steel. You've got to temper it, but you can have stainless spring steel as well. Okay. So, and if you're in America and you're going megapascals, well, convert it online, right? Google can convert anything, but it's roughly the same, as, it's a different unit, but functions in the same way mathematically as PSI that you use. And you'd be more familiar possibly with welding rods and things of that nature. Even here in Australia, if you buy general purpose welding rods, they're likely to be 6013. They'll have that on the box and they'll have that on each rod, okay? The 60 in the 6013 means 60,000 PSI, which is literally, you get one square inch of that weld metal in a fillet or a butt joint, whatever, then it will endure 60,000 pounds minimum before yielding. It'll behave in exactly the same way. If you use one of those low hydrogen rods, it's usually a 7018 or a 7016, something like that. The 70 just means 70,000 PSI. And I think that's largely by virtue of not having the hydrogen sort of porosity in the weld material itself. Just gives it a bit of an edge on its quote unquote strength. But anyway, the springs that you use, they're all around you. They just function like that. They're very carefully engineered so that they only ever function on this line and they never go beyond the yield point. They're live from the gym on Puntang Island, proudly supported by Visco Elasticity. Those aftermarket bolt-ons, like, available with such a wide range of kinematic presets, bump and rebound, fully customizable. I do admire that. Actual springs, on the other hand, the metal ones, they're quite durable if you don't overstress them and bend them permanently in the plastic zone. Just stay away from the yield point, dude. That's all it takes. Like, of course, in most decent mechanical designs, there are protections in place to stop you from overstressing any springs in the design. Like, in the case of coil springs or leaf springs in suspension systems, there are bump stops. Like, the range of motion is managed by the geometric limitations of the mechanisms which keeps the spring conservatively under the yield point in the wholly elastic zone. Even in less critical designs, like the case of a spring that closes the gate on a pool enclosure or something, you usually can't move the gate more than 180 degrees because that's when it runs into the fence, okay? It's limited. In the case of a clutch mechanism, the clutch fork has a defined maximum range of motion, just like the clothes peg or something. And that's the maximum possible deflection of the clutch spring, and it's wholly elastic. So you really can't overstress it. Obviously, the material and the design and the heat treatment, the dimensions, they all have to be right. But subject to getting that right, the clutch spring is going to outlast the friction plate. And a clutch actually works like this, okay? The three major components are the machine surface on the arse end of the flywheel, which is bolted to the arse end of the engine's crankshaft. And then there's the pressure plate of the clutch, which is bolted to the arse end of the flywheel. And then there's the friction plate, which people also call the clutch plate, which is sandwiched in between the pressure plate and the machine surface on the arse end of the flywheel. It's Caligula down there for the clutch plate. All that sandwiching. 
Those finger-shaped things there, right, in total, they comprise a thing called a diaphragm spring, which is a more or less plate-shaped spring with fingers cut into it, and it squeezes the pressure plate onto the flywheel with the friction plate sandwiched in between in a Roman orgy of torque transmission. And that's only when your foot is off the clutch, obviously. It's that spring pressure that locks the clutch mechanism up and it transmits drive from the crankshaft to the gearbox. And in the center of the friction plate is a really neat little splined hole. And during assembly of the powertrain, mainly because the gearbox loves the friction plate very, very much, he places his input shaft deep into the friction plate's splined hole in the hope that together, they can one day crank out a bunch of totally fat burnouts on private property, because doing that kind of thing on a public road would be illegal, obviously. Australia, where burnouts and free association are illegal, but it's totally okay to botch the rollout of a vaccine that would prevent the economy from collapsing again. Go ScoMo. Yes. Such a con. The gearbox and the clutch plate mate for years in this fashion. David Attenborough did a documentary on it. Copulator, he called it. You've doubtless seen it. So, when your foot is off the clutch pedal, the whole mechanism is locked up under pressure, transmitting drive. The pressure plate and the face of the flywheel clamp down on the friction plate, and thanks to the high-tech miracle of Spliny clutch copulation, try saying that with a bottle of Hendrix on board. The drive gets pumped deep into the gearbox. Yes. And the gearbox really enjoys that. And frankly, so do you. So that's all very satisfying, right? And everybody lives happily ever after. Until, of course, the jilted clutch plate posts the video of all of this up online just to get back at the gearbox for updating to a new and younger model with even more friction and greater engagement response. They really hate that. Even if you've got a throbbing beast of an engine and it's making, I don't know, 800 newton metres or something, it's really not that hard to restrain all that talk, right? Because it's not all that much talk, in fact. A fat man standing on the end of a diving board, scaring the kiddies in the pool. He's gonna be a couple of thousand Newton meters. So engines don't actually make that much talk in absolute terms. Their big party trick is that they can do it while they're spinning at 4,000 RPM. That's kind of difficult. Speaking of which, let's say you get to well, I don't know, 6,000 RPM or something in second gear, and you need to change up, okay? You need to decopulate the engine from the gearbox briefly to select third without a big expensive crunch, okay? And the whole mechanism, including spliny copulation and those radial fingery diaphragm spring thingos, it's spinning around and at 100 times a second, which is so fast that it's actually quite hard to conceptualize. And when you put your foot on the clutch, that effort gets transmitted by hydraulics or a cable to a forky thing, which is called, somewhat unimaginatively, a clutch fork, which reaches into the whole mechanism and presses down on the diaphragm spring, which loads up and releases the friction plate. And that decouples the flywheel from spliny porn, allowing you to shift without breaking a lot of expensive things. So that's nice. And the problem here that needs to be overcome right? It's that the fingers on diaphragm boy are spinning a hundred times a second and the clutch fork is completely stationary. So it is philosophically difficult for them to play nicely together in that moment. And that's why there's a fairly simple but really clever part in there called a thrust race or a thrust bearing or a throw out bearing because it does all three of those things and we're talking automotive here so why have one name for a thing when three would do? A thrust race allows the springy fingers to race around at 100 times a second and the clutch fork to not race around at all while still transmitting the satisfying thrust that bends the springs and decouples the gearbox from the crank without tearing the whole assembly into small, formerly expensive pieces. Isn't that grand? Most bearings deal with radial loads, okay? Like loads at 90 degrees to the axis the shaft is spinning on. Thrust bearings deal with 
axial loads, like loads that are in line with the shaft, basically. Thrust races are reasonably durable because they get used a lot and they have to be. Like, every time you change gear, basically, the thrust race is doing its thing. However, if you stop 60 times a day on the way to work or something and back, and each one of those averages out to 60 seconds per stop, and if you leave your foot on the clutch the whole time with first gear selected, getting ready to take off impatiently, that's a total of one hour a day of extra load on the thrust race, times five days a week, times 52 weeks a year. You can see where I'm going with this. It adds up to a lot of extra unnecessary heavy lifting for the thrust race which you can avoid entirely simply by selecting neutral and taking your foot off the clutch and just waiting patiently for the green light, dude. So there's reason number one. The second reason for doing this, selecting neutral, which most people really don't get, is that it's potentially very bad for your engine, like destructively bad. When you just sit there stopped with your foot on the clutch, fully declutched, waiting for the green light. And this is because the load that you're putting on the clutch mechanism, it gets resolved by the crankshaft. If you push on the arse end of the crankshaft using the clutch, the crank has to push back. Otherwise, it just falls out the front of the engine and that's never good. Now that's just Newton's third law, okay, which says that action and reaction are equal and opposite. It's the easiest one of the three laws to figure out. And you're doing it right now, sitting on your ass on your chair, okay? I'm doing it right now, standing up. Here's a stick drawing of a fat man standing on the floor, which is, hey. If you take away the fat man and replace this with a force system, okay, you've got the force due to gravity acting as a result of the attraction of the earth to the fat man's mass, the earth's only human, and the reaction of the floor. The floor's got to push back, dude. If the floor doesn't push back, if you're sitting on your ass on your chair now and the floor's not pushing back through the chair, that's kind of bad because you're falling through the floor, right? And you generally don't want that. It's okay if it happens to the boss or something, but not generally any good if it happens to you, okay? Action and reaction are equal and opposite. And it doesn't have to be this whole fat man standing here steady state thing either. It can be, I don't know, let's say you go to a gentleman's club, like a classy one, like Crack of Dawn or Head in the Clouds or that one where they do all the planning at Car Advice, the, um, the Meat Society. You go to one of those gentlemen's clubs. If you say the wrong thing to the bouncer and the bouncer punches you in the head, right? The force that the bouncer's fist exerts on your head is the same as the force that your head exerts on the bouncer's fist for the whole time that they're in contact. And everything works this way. If you have a car crash, then the force that your face exerts on the airbag is the same as the force that the airbag is exerting on your face from moment to moment in the millisecond domain through the crash. And obviously airbags are designed to increase the time duration of the collision and minimize the total load while the energy is managed, right? So these kinds of Newton's third law situations happen all around us, they're more or less ubiquitous. And this is exactly the same thing as what happens to your engine when you put your foot on the clutch. And all we've got to do is take this and rotate it through 90 degrees and we get a clutch sitting on a crankshaft inside an engine. If you reach in externally and push on the clutch like you do every time you declutch, right, then there has to be some miraculous reaction of the clutch in the other direction. Otherwise, the whole crankshaft and the clutch assembly just falls out the front of the engine if there's nothing pushing back. So wouldn't it be great if a really, really smart dude who designed the engine designed in the capacity to put a reaction force in place so that that didn't happen. Cleverly enough, therefore, one of the main bearings in the engine is designed to absorb that thrust and provide that reaction, keeping Newton really, really happy, even though he was a virgin when he died, <laughs>
go figure. And perhaps more importantly, keeping the crank in place to a fairly high tolerance in the backwards, forwards, floaty domain. All the main bearings absorb radial loads from the sucking, squeezing, banging and blowing going on upstairs, okay? In the combustion chambers, there's a lot of load there and it's not all that symmetrical, so that radial load gets absorbed by the main bearings pretty well. And there, all of the main bearings on the crank absorb radial load, okay? But only one of these bearings is typically designed to keep the crank from floating backwards and forwards. That thrust bearing is the one typically, that has faces that kind of wrap around, bearing faces that are U-shaped in section, okay? So every time you declutch, that bearing in the engine does a little bit of extra work pushing back. And if the clutch fork mechanism is adjusted too tight, because you're a bit ADHD about that kind of thing, not only does the thrust race in the clutch mechanism work unnecessarily hard all of the time, so does the thrust bearing inside the engine, which is definitely not ideal. And the inconvenient truth about thrust bearings on crankshafts is that they're not especially well designed. They're not pressure fed as well as the radial load faces, for example. The radial loads are huge in an engine. All that fire pushing the pistons down so hard, like... The thrust bearings are generally adequate at best, okay? They're not excellent. And you don't want to overwork them. So ideally, you don't want the crankshaft to be floating longitudinally very much at all because if it were to do that, it would overstress a lot of things that can also break expensively and turn an otherwise serviceable engine with years of life left into little more than scrap metal. Like con rods fail when thrust bearings don't work properly things of that nature. Every time you sit there with your foot on the clutch stopped, it's that thrust absorbing main bearing on the crankshaft that's really pushing back and resolving all of that extra unnecessary load, kind of overworked and underpaid, precariously poised there, waiting for something to fail. Like Scotty, somewhere down there in the bilges of the Enterprise, telling Captain Kirk that he just can't take it anymore. Something's gonna blow. Like you can replace the thrust race inside the clutch fairly easily. It's fairly cheap, comparatively, like not fun, you don't want to pay that money, but it's a pretty simple repair, mechanics do it all the time. Typically, you'd be in and out in a day, spliny love, re-established, yes. And you just tap and pay and drive off. But the thrust race in the engine, like dude, that's an engine out total rebuild proposition at best, and that's if you diagnose it before it lets go. And it is pretty hard to diagnose. If you break a con rod because the crank floated a bit too much one day, inconveniently, while the gearbox was making sweet, sweet love to the friction plate, this is going to be an easy fault to diagnose, but... You'll need to locate the nearest defibrillator before you ask the workshop supervisor how much to fix that, mate. So if you're going to stop for more than a few seconds ever, select neutral and just take your foot off the clutch. This is one small way that even on lockdown with endless daily news reports about how fucked the world really is and how impossible it is to immunise a few million people in an allegedly advanced democracy, like... We can order billions worth of joint strike fighters that we're never going to use to defend the nation, and even more expensive submarines, ditto, but we can't fight fires or immunise the population. Thanks, SCOMA. Even in the face of this national bleakness, this is one small positive step you can take to make Australia less shit. At least your small stick-shifted piece of this formerly great island nation, home to Dingo Piss Creek World Heritage Area and the fabled Golden Billabong. I love Australia, the used-to-be-lucky country, which exists today solely to collect the world's most useless politicians so that real countries can have something to chortle about while the rest of the world gets back on its feet. Thanks, Skomer.